Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called, I was taken on board a UFO, 10 astonishing true cases. While sightings are undeniably interesting, they're open to misinterpretation or misperception, and that's even true with cases involving landings. But when someone is taken on board a UFO, when they're face to face with the ETs, when they're touching the craft itself, these are cases that are very hard to explain away as anything other than what they appear to be. So these are also the cases that provide us the most information. Sightings are very limited in what they can tell us about ETs and their agenda. But when someone is taken on board, physically examined, speaks to the ETs, has a conversation, we learn a lot more about the ETs, who they are, why they're here, and what their agenda is on our planet. And that's what these cases are all about. These are all cases involving onboard experiences where people, most cases, do have missing time. Uh, these cases also involve considerable interaction between the people who are taken on board and the ETs, many different types of ETs as well. In fact, that's what I wanted to do with this episode, is kind of provide a broad spectrum of different types of cases from all over the world. I have cases from across the United States, some in South America, including Argentina and Brazil. There's one interesting case from India. I've got a case from Italy, a case from England. As we all know, this is a worldwide phenomenon, and these cases definitely reflect that. These are the most extensive type of UFO encounter a person can have, perhaps excluding cases of crash retrievals, but yeah, being taken on board a UFO, there's nothing quite like it. This is something that absolutely changes people's lives. People do have strong physical evidence of these cases. Many of these are multiple witness cases. There's one case involving a healing, uh, some involving other physiological reactions. So yeah, very remarkable on many levels. Got a bunch of cases that are, and a lot of information, so Let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about took place mostly in Weaver, Iowa. It's a great case. The main witness is Barbara Shutt, a nurse, so a good witness. She's allowing her real name to be used. She's had multiple experiences over a period of years. Now, Barbara Shutt, the main witness, first discovered that she was having contact as an adult after attending a UFO conference and she went home and some weeks later she started waking up to find inexplicable bruises and marks on her body. So now knowing a little bit about the subject, she realized that she had many incidents in her life pointing towards contact and she eventually contacted UFO researcher Dr. Leo Sprinkle who was really one of the first researchers to use hypnosis to recover missing time. So Barbara went under hypnosis with Dr. Leo Sprinkle and uncovered multiple incidents of contact in her life. And as Leo Sprinkle says, it's a remarkable story. So I'll just quote Barbara directly here regarding her first experience. As she says, the first known abduction was in 1959 at the age of eight. I was examined by an alien. A sample of flesh was taken from the first finger of my left hand. The scar remains to this date, but we became friends. The alien told me he would see me again. He would teach me what I needed to know later and that someday I would be doing important work. When I grew up, I would understand. So Barbara, under hypnosis, recalled seeing shorter ETs and a tall one who wore a uniform with a large V design on it. And he actually gave Barbara his name. He said his name was Quasgaw. I found that incredibly interesting because that's almost exactly the same name that Betty Andreessen's main contact was, Quasga. So I'm wondering if this could be the same ET. At any rate, Barbara's next encounter that she was able to recall 
occurred when she was 22 years old. And again, as she says in her own words, the second known abduction was on April 17, 1973. There was a time loss involved. I was dematerialized in my car and taken out up through the roof into an alien craft. I was in various rooms with smaller alien types and the same alien as in my childhood experience of 1959. So if she describes the little greys as being quite friendly, and she says, They are little, like children. They make me smile. I don't see any ears. They have no hair. Their eyes are black. Their mouth is like a hole. They have baby soft skin, lighter than ours. After the examination, I told the aliens I would do my best not to disappoint them. I was returned to my car through the roof. It was just five years later when she had a really dramatic sighting with her brother, 1978, of three large glowing globes hovering over power lines at a farm in southeastern Iowa. So this is when she really started to investigate UFOs on her own. But it wasn't long before she had another onboard experience. As Barbara says, the third known abduction was on September 29, 1981. This time there was some conscious recall. I was taken from home onto an alien craft. Barbara said that the craft itself was shaped like a derby hat was huge with colored lights. As she says, it's as big as a house with a big dome and a rim going around the bottom. I'm going inside, moving like I'm on a conveyor belt. So she was taken inside. She believes that she may have been drugged as she underwent a complete neurological exam and apparently an implantation. She did have physical evidence in the form of bruises, soreness, dizziness, nausea, and a general malaise. She did notice a strange scar at the level 8 thoracic vertebrae, which is still present to this day. And she had x-rays which showed a compression of the 8th thoracic vertebrae. So something is going on here. And it was following hypnosis to recall this particular incident. She drove home, and when she got home, something very strange happened. She began to do automatic writing, apparently from this ET, the one named Quasga. What she wrote through automatic writing was, quote, Be happy, Barbara. Success is at your doorstep. We are proud of you. You are our special host. We will guide you every step of the way. The ET, Quasga, actually signed his name and promised to return. So they said early on in her first onboard case that she was going to be doing important work. And this is apparently when this started because Barbara began to join various UFO groups and began to do her own investigations. Regarding the sighting in 1978, she actually called the local airport and she was told by an airport official that what she saw was, quote, three geese with lights strapped on their backs. And the airport officer just hung up on her. And as Barbara says, that really insulted me. Yeah, that is insulting. So I think this is what really gave her the encouragement to start investigating herself. She did find other witnesses to that sighting, but they refused to speak about it. So this is when she formed her own group to help others. As Barbara says, seeing a UFO can be very traumatic. It's something you don't know and don't understand. If people realize how many others saw UFOs, then they wouldn't feel so singled out. That's why we're here, to show people that they're not going nuts. They're not going insane. That is something a lot of contactees consider. Like, am I going crazy? No, I don't think they are. So many people are having these experiences, and Barbara's experiences continued. Her latest one occurred in 1982. As Barbara says, in her own words, the fourth known abduction was on January 22, 1982. Local hypnotist did a regression. I was taken from home, floated across 
a cornfield into a craft, an examination with particular interest in wrists and fingers. Wires or tubes were attached to the forehead and fed information. She says a tube was inserted to her body and she could feel fluid going through her arm and she felt sort of a crawling skin electrical feeling. This was the same E.T. Kwasga plus taller, darker clothed beings. And she believes that they were preparing her for a UFO conference uh, that would take place one month later. And uh, she did have physical traces of this onboard experience, including bruises on both her left and right arm with punctures or needle marks, uh, which were verified by doctors. So this is when Barbara was going totally public. And apparently as a result, she was let go from her job as a nurse, which shows how important it is that we remove the stigma from people who have onboard experiences. So this affected her so profoundly that she eventually became an investigator for the J. Allen Hynek Center of UFO Studies, QFOS, and later a MUFON field investigator, researching her own cases and helping many other people. And in fact, she even became a state section director for MUFON, apparently fulfilling the mission given to her by the ETs. So needless to say, but I'll say it anyway, she's now a believer. She knows the truth. And as Barbara says, I used to think it was silliness to claim that anybody could be taken aboard a UFO. But now I know abductions do happen. That's the first case. The second case I'd like to cover occurred in Alabama, more specifically along Highway 31 from Morris to Birmingham. It was October 1973, and Cynthia Vodavaz, then age 12, was being driven by her mother to her ballet class. And as Cynthia says in her own words, I noticed an object. It was big and round and bright green and had a yellow ring around it. It was coming over the trees. It stayed with us. Mind you, they're on the highway now. There's other cars around them. They had just passed Gardendale when this object began to descend in front of them. And Cynthia's mother asked, is it going to land? Well, it looked like it was. And at this point, their car actually stalled and several other cars around them stopped. So there were a lot of witnesses to this incident. And as Cynthia says in her own words, the object kept coming down and seemed to stop near the wires. It seemed bigger than a plane. My mother rolled down the window, which really upset me. I thought I was going to run. In the car next to me was a man whose face was lit up. He was leaning towards us. Cynthia's mom actually asked the other driver, Do you think it's a UFO? And the man replied, I guess so. And suddenly a bright light filled their car, Cynthia and her mother. And at this point, Cynthia felt a strange sort of paralyzing heaviness. And as she says in her own words, the next thing I remember, I was sitting in the car seat, but my feet were in mother's lap and the car door slammed on my back and it woke me up. My mother seemed to wake up. She was trying to start the car. At this point, the UFO was gone. They continued the drive to the ballet class only to realize that they were quite late, 40 minutes late, and in fact, the class was ending. So they didn't know quite what to make of this at the time. It remained a mystery for many years. Cynthia grew up, she pursued a dancing career, but as she says, for many years, I didn't know what had happened, only that I had been troubled by something. But after doing some research, she realized that this experience was a typical missing time UFO encounter. She knew what that meant. There was more to this than she remembered. And she actually met with researcher Bud Hopkins, who hypnotized her. And no surprise, an onboard UFO encounter emerged. Under hypnosis, she remembered being taken back to the scene on the highway. And while she was under hypnosis, 
she remembers thinking that first, could this be a car accident? Because there were cars stopped all around them on the highway. But it wasn't an accident. As Cynthia says, the people ahead were screaming and putting arms out the window. And this thin thing was coming. And as he passed the car, the people were subdued. As he got to our car, mother rested her head on the door. Then three small beings, whitish looking, came to my door and opened it. I tried to put my fingers in the air conditioning vents to hold on, but the vents broke. So at this point, Cynthia was floated out of the car with the beings and into a craft. She found herself in a white room. She was laid out on a table next to another table with another girl on it. And as Cynthia says, she had kind of sandy, curly hair, and she was in the same predicament as me. They were walking around the table doing an examination. I remember they placed a needle in my navel. That's all she really recalls was being physically examined. Afterward, she found herself being placed in what looked like a kind of transparent globe and floated back into the car. So this affected her very much uh, for the rest of her life. As she says, I think about it every night when I go to sleep. And she got married and her husband started having experiences. As she says, they're visiting us together. He woke up with an incision mark two inches long on his back, so I know it's still happening. Uh, and she also remembers uh, being taken as a very young girl. She recalled this without regressive hypnosis. She recalled being taken on board a craft. They showed her a small BB-like object and told her that they were going to place it in her nose. Uh, it actually did cause some pain and she went to the doctor later and he verified that there apparently was something, a scar at the roof of her mouth where she remembers this being placed in her body. It's definitely an, an interesting case and kudos to Cynthia for going public with it. And here's the next case which took place in Sonora, California. It's quite interesting. And this, again, involves, to an extent, two witnesses. Uh, this occurred on October 30th, 1977. The main witness is Martha Thorne. She had retired some eight years earlier. She was a former horse and dog trainer and also a waitress. And she and her husband, Ernest, were driving along Highway 108, from Oakdale to their home in Sonora, California. They had just passed Jamestown, this was that night, when without warning, they saw little lights and what looked like a big cloud of bluish smoke that quickly enveloped their car. At the same time, their car jerked, came to a stop, and the headlights went out. Her husband, Ernest, who had been dozing in the passenger seat, woke up and said, what happened? And Martha said, oh my God, I don't know what's happening. She was trying unsuccessfully to start the car. And this is when they noticed a very large orange bright light moving towards them. So that quite startled them. Martha took her hands off the steering wheel. At this point, the engine suddenly revved to life. Uh, the light was gone, so was the fog, and they were traveling along the highway. And she turned to her husband, Ernest, what in the hell happened to us? And he, of course, had no idea. They did notice some strange after effects. Both their watches stopped at exactly the same time. They would never run again, despite attempts to repair them. And they said their car also never worked the same, and they soon got rid of it. So after thinking about this and doing some research, they realized that this was a missing time encounter and they agreed to go under hypnosis. Ernest didn't recall anything, but Martha did. She recalled being taken from her car while her husband stayed behind in the car. And as Martha says in her own words, the car lights went out and the engine stopped. 
The car jerked violently backward and began to raise off the ground. We were in complete darkness. I put my head out the window and I saw a being about four and a half feet long, upside down, floating on its belly outside my window. So she says at this point, their car was at least three feet off the ground. And these ETs place what she believes like a soft snow white blanket over her as she was lifted up into what she would soon discover was a spacecraft. And she was quite frightened until the ETs began talking to her telepathically. They said, don't worry, we won't hurt you. And she could now see she's looking around. She's in a very large room with shiny and bright. And she was laying on a table. And as Martha says, it was like going into the belly of the fish. It was safe. I remember thinking I might have died and gone to heaven. But of course she didn't die and she wasn't in heaven. She was on a steel looking table and there were three figures surrounding her. She said they looked very human like but wore skin tight suits that covered everything except their faces. She said, she said that they had large round eyes, no apparent eyebrows, flat noses, just a slit for a mouth and kind of a quote, smoky looking complexion. And there were a lot of beings on board this craft, she said, most of who were busy with other things. Only the three who were around her paid any attention at all to her. But looking around, she saw all kinds of weird sort of white box shaped equipment, which she believed was electronic. But yeah, a lot of beings, as Martha says, there were hundreds upon hundreds of little guys working on a work table. It was amusing in a lot of ways because they were so busy. When one of them got in the other's way, he'd just hop over. So this was not a scary experience for her whatsoever. She felt no fear at this point. In fact, she felt it was almost a spiritual experience. And as she says in her own words, I've always been a person who would let myself be run over and intimidated. They said that would not happen anymore. I don't know how, but I knew what they said. To me, after it was over, it was a wonderful experience. I don't regret the experience a bit. So yeah, a very positive experience for her, though initially quite frightening. And her husband verifies it to the extent that he can, but it was just her who was taken on board. Now we move to the next case, which took place in North Carolina, near Monroe. It was late one evening on March 9, 1979, when Patrick M. Udy, he's 43 years old, a car salesman, he was driving along Sykesville Road, about 18 miles from his home in Monroe, North Carolina, and he was just going over a large steel bridge that spans the Rocky River, this is that night, when he saw a brilliant floodlight appear overhead. And as he says in his own words, it was brighter than any searchlight I'd ever seen. The next thing I knew, I was driving along the Morgan Hill Road, eight miles from where I'd seen the bright light. And in fact, he knows the exact location. It was right in front of the GB Helms store. So he was quite dazed at this point. His eyes were burning. And of course, the bridge that he had been crossing was now nowhere in sight. He knows that it was about 3 a.m. when he left. It was now 6 a.m. So he had a considerable amount of missing time. He drove home. He woke up the next morning with a very strong feeling that he had been taken on board this craft, though he had no specific clear memories of it. As he says, all I had was a dim, foggy recollection of being in a spaceship, of coming face to face with strange creatures. So it was over the next few days that he did notice an unusual rash and itching sensation on his fingers and ankles. And he also noticed something else. His gas tank was much fuller than it should have been, given the distance that he traveled. So he started to speculate at this point that not only was he taken, but his car was taken as well was the only way to explain how there was so much gas in his tank. So over the next few weeks and months, he had began having very powerful flashbacks 
of being in a strange room, sitting in a weird dentist-like chair, seeing glowing panels and strange creatures surrounding him. Uh, this caused him all kinds of anxiety, and he finally decided to seek hypnosis just so he could figure out what had happened to him. As he says, I just couldn't get it off my mind. It just kept coming back. I wanted to make sure. So he found a hypnotist by the name of Dr. Richard Pino. The session lasted two hours, but as Pat says, when it was over, I had the answer I was seeking. I had been abducted by a UFO. Under hypnosis, he recalled his car being pulled into the air and placed into a room that kind of reminded him of a car showroom. Being a car salesman, I can see that. But he says short creatures surrounded him. He felt no fear at this point, but instead he says he felt almost, quote, euphoric. Uh, the being that was closest to him was about five feet tall, and he asked all kinds of questions, such as how the craft operated and so, for, so forth. But as Patrick said, the being never spoke a word. And it took him a while to realize what was happening, but he was having telepathic communication. But he still, to this day, has a hard time remembering exactly what was being said. This taller being did seem to be in charge. There were other shorter beings. He was taken from the room where his car was into a dark room which contained a seat much like a dentist's chair that he had seen in his flashbacks. And he did feel some fear at this point, as he says, I was really scared. I was put in the chair and strapped down. I'm still not sure, but I think the being ran some tests on me. He was then laid down on a steel table. He says they covered his body with a clear, odorless liquid while a metallic-looking sphere floated over his body. At one point, the beings left the room, and this is when he did begin to feel some fear. But when they returned, he said his euphoria also returned, and his fear left remembers then being floated into another brightly lit room. Inside this room, there were two chairs and a weird panel. And he believes this may have been the control room. As he says, I don't know what the spaceship looked like, but now I remembered being on board, standing in what must have been the cockpit. There was a space being. It was wearing a silvery spacesuit, but I couldn't see its face. It was covered by a dark visor. He does remember looking outside a window or porthole and saw the earth far below him. And that's basically what he recalled under hypnosis. He was really glad he had the, se the session because it totally relieved his anxiety. As he says, going to that night of that encounter has made me feel a lot better. It brought back things I thought were true and it eased my mind because I knew that I wasn't just dreaming this stuff up but I don't think I'll ever be able to shut it out of my mind. So he initially kept quiet with all this, but finally decided to speak publicly because he knew that there were others out there going through this. And as he says, there are other people who have seen things, and maybe now they'll step forward and tell it like it is. All right, let's move to the next case. And this one is quite interesting. It took place near Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And it involves actually someone who is world famous, a world famous musician. This occurred on October 15, 1979. And the main witness is Luli Oswald. She's a world famous pianist. Quite an interesting person. She was actually born as a princess. Princess Paola di Vigiano but was raised in secret by another family who agreed to adopt her. Uh, she was raised by Enrique Oswald, a conductor. And she was 55 years old, again, 1979, and she was driving with her student, Fose Milan, age 25, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to the town of Saquamera. And they saw this luminous, actually several luminous glowing objects coming up out of the water. They're driving along the coast. And they thought, wow, we had this amazing sighting. But returning back the same way, they somehow took a wrong turn 
And again, they saw a UFO coming out of the water. And this time it came out so fast it drew a huge column of water with it. And as it came overhead, oh, I mean, their car seemed to be taken over. And it began to weave across the road. And they said the doors began to open and shut by themselves. And looking up, they could see this huge cigar-shaped object with orange glowing windows hovering over the mountainside right along next to them. They both drew pictures of it, as you can see here. They then saw three balls of light swooping down towards them. At this point, everything seemed to stop, went back to normal, and they raced away to a coffee shop. And this is when they realized they had two hours, at least, of missing time. So Luli eventually went under hypnosis with Dr. Silvio Lago, and she recalled that the car itself was pulled up inside a beam of light into this craft. As she says under hypnosis, our car is being grabbed by the top. A light from the small one, the UFO, is holding us. The light clasps our car. We're being held prisoners by this light. It's horrible. So she was extremely frightened by this encounter. It was not pleasant for her. She found herself standing in a room outside her car, and standing around them were strange-looking creatures which she said had gray skin, thin arms, pointed features, which actually reminded her of rats. But uh, she said they had slit-like noses and uh, slit-like mouths and were quite short, only four and a half feet tall. Luli and her companion were both undressed and examined with light beams. Uh, she says they took hair samples from her, gave her a gynecological exam, and they told her that they had contacted her because of her abilities with ESP. But she, they also told her that she was of no real use to them, that they were more interested in her companion. So she thought perhaps it was because of her age, being 55 years old, and no longer uh, able to reproduce, that they had no real interest in her. But she did say that they examined her. She said, they are putting tubes in my ear. There are tubes everywhere. They are pulling on my hair. They look like rats. They have huge, horrible rat ears, and their mouths are like slits. They are touching me all over with their thin arms. There are five of them. Their skin is gray and sickly. So you can see her hypnosis session online. It is in Portuguese, I believe. Uh, but again, the ETs were more interested in her student. And she saw him laying on a marble-like table and looking very pale, as she says, as though he were dead. And they, you know, there's some conflicting reports on this, but they told her that they came from, quote, a small galaxy near Neptune, which she knew couldn't be true, or from a tunnel under the South Pole in Antarctica which she also thought was absurd, so that's kind of interesting. But both witnesses said that they had several physical ailments afterward, though these are not described in any detail. But it was certainly a case that caused quite a sensation in Brazil at the time that it occurred. And here's the next case that I'd like to talk about, which took place in Texas. And the main witness has decided to be anonymous. The investigators call her Megan Elliott. This is a pseudonym, and it was investigated by the Mutual UFO Network. It took place on August 21st, 1980. This is quite an unusual case. Megan and her one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Renee, were driving late at night back to their home in Texas after visiting Megan's mother. And Megan had been planning on staying there longer, but Renee had developed an ear infection and also had a rash on her leg, which was persisting despite doctors' repeated attempts to heal her. So although it was late at night and it was a long drive home, 70 miles, Megan decided that she had better leave for the safety of her child. And they were about halfway through the trip back home and had just reached the location near Lake Fork Creek, when the radio began making strange noises. 
Shortly later, her headlights dimmed, and a loud buzzing noise filled the car. The next thing Megan knew, her car, a Honda Civic, was being levitated up off the highway. And looking up through the windshield, she saw that they were being drawn towards a metallic object with a double row of bright lights hovering very low above them. And just a moment later, the car was inside this craft, and she found herself in a round, seamless room, brightly lit with no visible light source. Renee, her little one-and-a-half-year-old, was pointing out the windows and saying, Look, Mom, look! And at this point, Megan heard a voice in her head telepathically saying, Megan, get Renee and get out of the car. So this absolutely terrified her, and she says, I literally panicked. I just sat there, and I could remember not really shaking, but feeling my insides churning and thinking, God, what do I do now? So she rolled up the windows and locked the doors, at which point a door in this large room opened, and this weird kind of fog rolled into the room along the floor, and shortly later she saw a, quote, little creature. And this being, this E.T., said telepathically, get out of the car. So she describes this as very much like Gray's. She said it had a large head, no ears, no eyebrows, oval eyes without lashes, no hair on the entire body, a broad nose with two apertures or nostrils. The mouth was a little slit, thin neck, thin body, thin arms, long fingers, four on each hand. And the skin, she said, was sort of like the texture of silly putty. So she's refusing to open the door, the car door, when she hears a loud click and the car door opens by itself and suddenly falls off the hinges. At this point, her fear completely left her. She had a feeling of peace and tranquility come over her. And this being led Megan and little Renee into a round room. Inside, there were two more grays and two tables and she saw a panel covered with colored lights, multicolored lights. And Megan was unable to resist. She was very cooperative as they told her to get up on the table, which she did. And she says they placed metal clamps about four inches wide, snap, across my ankles, my wrist, and chest. And she looked over at her daughter, who was also being placed on a table, also being held down with clamps. And she had no fear at this point. Uh, Neither did her daughter. In fact, as Megan says, she loves it. She's very excited. A weird yellow mist sprayed down on them. Megan felt a radiating heat or something coming from, she believes, the table. She saw strange probe-like instruments coming down from the ceiling on long arms and moving over her body, which caused a strange sense of pressure and occasional pain. She looked over at her daughter and saw that she was also being examined and that a needle-like device was being inserted first into her nose and then into her navel. So this concerned Megan, and she told the ETs, Don't hurt my baby. She's sick. And the ETs replied, She's not anymore. After the exam, these clamps retracted. Megan got off the table voluntarily. She could now move on her own. She saw her daughter crawling around on the table. And as Megan says, I got her off the table. She liked them. They were then taken into another room where there was a small bed. Uh, They remained there for quite some time. A drawer came out of the wall and had little white and green and yellow pellets. She was told to eat them, that it was for their nourishment, which both she and Renee did. She says they melted in the mouth. Her daughter Renee thought they were little candies. Megan is not sure how long they stayed there. Um, She thinks it could be several days or maybe even longer uh, because she kept falling asleep and eating. As she says, they told me to eat so I would survive. The nourishment that our systems require for survival. So we ate them. And the ETs did come into the room periodically. They told her that Megan had been very helpful. And as she says, 
They asked if I was allowed to ask any three questions about the universe that I wanted and was guaranteed an answer, what would they be? I told them I didn't know, and I wanted time to think, to see what they were. And they seemed to agree to that. She asked them, will I ever see my family again? Because she's wondering if she's going to be taken permanently. And they said, yes, but life will not be the same. Things will happen, and it begins to change the structure of things. So she again fell asleep. The ETs returned, and Megan asked her three questions. She pointed outside and said, what is out there? And the ET said, can you be more specific in that question? She said, I'm not sure. You know, that time I saw the stars out the window. What were those stars, and what was out there? The ET replied, are you referring to just what's outside of where you are at this moment, or everywhere? And Megan said, everywhere. I want to know everything. The ET replied, someday I will answer that question when you are ready, but for now, the universe goes more than what you could ever imagine, or that any person or anyone can imagine. So Megan's second question was, if you are here with us now, why don't you make yourselves known to us? The ET said, that isn't about the universe, but I will answer anyway. Humans have a tendency for annihilation. You are a very fearful population. And if we interfered in any way, the earth could be destroyed. You have to live your life in your own way. If we made ourselves known, it would be a very fearful planet, and you'd probably destroy yourselves. But one way, day, we will, in order to help. As Megan says, it's almost as if they seemed afraid. They can't interfere with us because they would be destroyed as well. So Megan's third question was, why me? Why do you go around picking up mothers and children if you can't even tell Earth why you're here? And the ET replied, well, that's why we're here. So this kind of freaked her out, at which point the ET said, be calm. We chose samples from the popu population that already exhibited intelligence and capabilities of understanding properties and theories beyond the present day time. So she began to ask more questions, which they answered. She said, where are you from? They said, we're from the same place you are. Megan said, how could that be if we're so different? The ET said, we are not different on the inside. We can think, we can reason. The Creator made us. They told her that they did have a planet that they go to and that she'd actually already seen it, though Megan has no memory of this. She was fascinated by how the door would disappear into the wall with no seams. So she asked them how they did that, and they said it was a type of metal they used which allowed it to bond together and disappear at will. So at some point she was returned back to the car, which was lowered back on the road, she found herself now only five miles from home, and so there was apparently no missing time in terms of days or weeks. So that's very curious. She woke up the next morning and mostly only remembered this in sort of a dream state. But they did notice something. Renee's earache and rash were completely gone. She was healed. Megan did have some emotional changes. She became very pensive and distant for a couple of weeks, something which all her family and friends noticed. It was two weeks later, she's driving along. She saw another UFO and had a full-blown panic attack, fearing that she was going to be taken again. And this is when she really realized that she had been taken and uh, did go under hypnosis to recall these events. Uh, she thought that perhaps the ETs were tracking her by her car, so she decided she was going to trade it in. And that's when something very interesting happened. The mechanic told her as he was inspecting the car, why did you take the door off? She told him, sir, I have never taken it off. Uh, but under hypnosis, yeah, she recalled that the door had in fact been removed. So although she did remember much of this experience in sort of as a dream, she did go under hypnosis to fill out all the details. And it's quite an unusual case because she did get a lot of information.
Now here's another case which was very widely publicized in Argentina and caused quite a sensation. It occurred on December 15, 1981 to a truck driver on the outskirts of San Luis del Palmar in Argentina. This case comes from researcher Eduardo Alfredo Lopez. And the main witness it's 41 years old, father of six, and his name is Ruben Meneses. And as he says in his own words, I was driving home from work and thinking how wonderful that soon I would be with my family. Suddenly the night became day, and I wondered how the sun could be shining at such an hour. For some reason, I felt my skin crawl, and my blood ran like ice water in my body. Something deep inside me was warning me of disaster soon to strike. So it's still nighttime, although there's, it's so bright. It's bright like day is what he's describing. He screeched the truck to a stop, and this tingling sensation filled him, and he watched as his truck, with him in it, rose up into the air. As he says, I saw cars and trucks passing by at high speed on the road. I felt it in all my body like a tingling, and I saw the cab and the whole truck wrapped in a very powerful white light that went through everything. Then I half faded, although I never lost consciousness for a moment. I was suddenly inside a great ship with red, green, and blue flashing lights. The walls were mirrored like shiny steel. I kept my eyes closed but yet I could see that I was floating, lying face down but suspended in the air. I began to have terrible thoughts that I had gone mad or that I would soon be murdered. He apparently opened his eyes at this point because as he says, then I saw the space creatures. They were standing around me, little man-like people, about three feet tall. Their skin was pale green and very wrinkled. They had a very small forehead and thin arms that reached almost to their feet. I only have a dim recollection that they talked to me, asked me questions, and that I answered them. I didn't move my lips, but we talked with our minds. I saw mental images. I pray to God that he will be merciful and let me know what happened, what they did to me. The torment of not knowing is more than I can bear. The next thing he remembers is he was 55 miles from his original location now near the town of Paso de la Patria, near Baron de Estrada. So he was deeply traumatized. He was rushed to doctors. And as one of his doctors says, he seems now to be a helpless mixture of child and man. He cries all the time, sobbing like a little child. It will take much time and patience before he will be a man again. The possibility is great that he may never recover from his incredible experience. So yeah, he was very traumatized. And in fact, his physician, Dr. Alberto Vidal, also examined him and says, I have never seen anybody in his state of mind. He must have had the most terrible experience that can be imagined. He cried like a boy. The poor man is quite bad with fear, anguish, and a nervous state that almost does not allow him to speak. This man had a tremendous experience. He is having a total nervous breakdown. The only thing he has left is a reddish stripe in his eyes, which is now dissipating, and which practically didn't let him see light for several days. He still wears glasses today, even inside the house, because the light bothers him a lot. This is one of the most common physiological reactions people have with a UFO encounter is eye irritation. But yeah, this case did receive a lot of attention. In fact, it was researched by government investigators uh, who, after examining Rubin's truck, saw that it showed signs of being exposed to a very high heat source and so did soil samples in the area. And as investigator Pedro Varacia says, the soil had been turned to glass by temperatures of 1500 to 1600 degrees. So yeah, quite a dramatic case. This next case is also very interesting. This took place near Shrewsbury, England. 
1983. There are three witnesses. This is a multiple witness case. These three witnesses were having a good time at Tiffany's Disco in Shrewsbury, England, and it was late in the evening when they decided to return home along the A5 road in Shropshire, England. And it was right outside the location of the Shamrock Cafe, right next to Reekin Hill, this is near the small town of Atcham, that something very strange happened to them. So the three witnesses are Viv Hayward and Rosemary Hawkins, both 27 years old, and Valerie Walters, age 26. And they believe it was around 2 a.m., and it was Rosemary who first noticed these strange hovering lights. And I'll just quote Rosemary directly, as she says, I opened the car window to get a better look. The lights became blinding. There was no noise. It became obvious we were looking at a flying saucer, a UFO. It followed us along the road. We were very frightened. Viv tried putting her foot down on the accelerator, but it was as if the brakes were on. Then the lights dimmed and the craft disappeared. We were so excited we drove straight to the Telford police station. And as they got there, it was then that they realized that they were missing time, at least 20 minutes. And they were put in touch with a UFO researcher and lawyer by the name of Harold Harris. And he realized that this was a genuine case. And he encouraged the woman to use hypnosis to recover their memories of the missing time, which they agreed to do. So they were separated. Uh, the hypnosis session was conducted by Dr. Joseph Jaffe and a couple of others and each three women were interviewed and hypnotized separately and recalled being taken on board and did recall very similar events. As Rosemary says, uh, and first she recalled seeing the bright lights and then as she says, under hypnosis, we are so frightened. The lights are attached to a spacecraft of some kind. I am floating and I'm not in the car anymore with Viv and Val. I feel big and bloated. It is a semi-circular room. I'm on a bed in the room, like a long table on a stand. There's something coming. I can hear them. Something in the room. It's metal. It sort of re rolls on wheels. It's about four feet tall, round on top, with a round body and roundish legs. It's looking at me. There's more coming. There are four. They are around me. She could not see any faces, but she saw their heads moving up and down. And then she says, that's how I know they are talking about me. They don't seem to be nasty. They just want to have a look. I feel so relaxed and they feel friendly. I like them. That's what Rosemary recalled. Now here's what Viv recalls. This is Viv talking in her own words. I feel I'm floating. I'm being drawn up. The car is being taken up. I can't see the road anymore. I see a white cloud. I'm on my own. I can see the door of the UFO opening. It is round. I'm looking through the car windscreen. The car roof is going in first. It's like two big doors opening. It's made of steel. Now inside the craft, she saw what appeared to be windows and lights and a bunch of kind of computers and TV type screens. And she says, I can feel these aliens holding me down. They seem as though they have taken me out of the car. I'm in a chair. They're holding me down. They feel very strong. They are trying to find out things from me. They want to know how we're made. It feels as if they are taking something from my body, my legs. There's a lot of pain in my legs. They're putting their hands inside my legs and pulling my bones. They're telling me not to be frightened. Somebody in charge is talking to me. They have scanned me, my top half, and then the rest of my body. They are four feet tall. They have no hair. They are ugly. They have a strange looking nose, thin arms. I can't see their legs, but they're dressed in a green cloak. They look like men. So that's what Viv recalled, and Valerie has a very similar story. Uh, as she says, I can see lights. It's hovering and gliding towards us. There's a bright light in my head. I feel big and clumsy. I'm walking down the road looking for Rosemary. Somebody has touched me on my shoulder. Somebody's carrying me. 
I can feel them, but I can't see them. I hear voices. They seem to be telling me, don't be afraid. So she looks around her and she sees a male and a female figure, she believes, dressed in a green robe, uh, which is what Viv recalled. And as Valerie says, the woman was fascinated by my shoes. She took them off me and tried walking in them. She had bare feet. The creatures kept feeling my clothes and my hair. I wasn't afraid of them, but was frightened of what was happening. So that's what they recalled. The next thing they know, all three were placed back in their car. And I'll just let Rosemary describe this process as she says, I am floating again. I can see the car. Everything has gone black. I'm in the car now. Val and Viv are there with me. Viv's got her foot down hard on the accelerator. We are trying to get away from it. And Viv recalled the same thing. All she says is, they carry me to my car. The car is back on the road. So after recalling this, all three women are, of course, convinced that they shared an onboard UFO experience. And as Rosemary says, we are not cranks. We never intended it to go this far. We thought it was all over two years ago, but when we were told there was 20 minutes of our lives missing, it was natural that we should want to find out what happened. It seems the aliens were waiting for us three because we are so different in our personality and outlooks. I know people may laugh, but we know what happened and we're telling the truth. That night will live with me for the rest of my life. I know what happened that night and the memory will live with me until the day I die. Valerie agrees, and she says, I know from what happened to me that beings from another planet have been here, and I'm proud they chose me to visit. So this was widely researched by not only researchers, the police as well, because they went to the police. And as police chief Norman Collinson says, it certainly isn't a hoax. I am perfectly satisfied that this is not a hoax. One of the researchers, Michael Sachs, says, This case must be the most convincing that has ever emerged. The most astounding thing is the time factor. These women may never have discovered what they'd been through if they had failed to notice the missing 20 minutes. There is certainly no way the three women could have collaborated before they went under hypnosis. I think there's absolutely no reason to disbelieve the woman's evidence. All the signs show under hypnosis were typical of them going through a traumatic experience. I doubt if we'll see anything like it again. And researcher Harold Harris, who also investigated the case, agrees. As he says, I have no doubt this UFO existed. It was a nuts and bolts craft of unknown origin. These women were hypnotized individually, and there was no collusion. Yet they described similar things. This is a unique case. This case will provide vital evidence for us. I'm sure these women here have met alien beings, and they're telling the truth. I'm certainly convinced that everything these ladies said happened actually did happen. So yeah, a very interesting multi-witness case. I just have two more I'd like to cover. And here's a very interesting case, which apparently took place in India near the Ganges River. This is in Bihar, India. Uh, this case only comes from one source, so it's not super well verified, but I include it here for what it's worth. Yeah, 1985. The main witness is a 17-year-old girl named Indu Shah. This case was leaked out and apparently was never supposed to become public. But according to the report on this case, Indu was found wandering, dazed and disoriented by a local farmer. Uh, he noticed that she had some what looked like burned patches on her skin. She'd been missing for three days but had no memory of this. Uh, she was immediately taken into medical care and knowing that she had been missing under unusual circumstances and seeing these marks on her body, they tested her for radioactivity and it came out positive. And so in an attempt to find out what happened during this missing time, they injected her with sodium pentothal 
and she recalled walking through a field when a silver saucer hovered overhead and beamed her on board. She said two dwarf-like figures said that no harm would come to her, and she was placed in a glass booth while a weird machine was lowered over her body from head to foot. So this appeared to be some kind of examination. It's all she really recalls. The next thing she knows, she was near the location where she had been taken. And again, this whole story was allegedly covered up until a classified document was leaked by disgruntled high-ranking officials in the Indian Ministry of Health. So it's an unusual case, but again shows that this is a worldwide phenomenon. And now we get to the last final case, which is also quite interesting, a multi-witness case which took place near Cadore in the Italian Alps. This took place on August 15, 1986. Now the main witnesses are a husband and wife by the name of Angelo and Grazia Ricci. They were on vacation and were picnicking in the forest, on the edge of a forest, when this incident happened. And as Angelo says in his own words, We were sitting at the edge of the woods when we noticed an extraordinary light descending rapidly towards us. We saw it was a luminous white disk, about 30 feet in diameter. It landed almost in front of us, only a few yards away, without making the slightest sound. We were dumbfounded. So this was about 1 a.m. when they saw this disk land. They watched it for about 10 minutes, and when it left, they looked at their watch, and they saw that it read 3 a.m., so they had missing time, and as Angelo says, I was stunned. Grazia and I had no recollection of anything during those two hours, yet we both felt exhausted and were thoroughly confused. And looking at the site where this craft had landed, they did see crushed and burned grass. Now Grazia, just earlier, had read about recent sightings in this exact area. So they started to do their research. They knew the writer of the article was Antonio Schiumiento. Antonio Schiumiento is a very well-known Italian investigator. So they contacted him, and he began an investigation. He had been placed under hypnosis, and no surprise, an onboard encounter emerged. And I'll just quote Grazia extensively, because she describes very well what happened to her. As she says, two human-like shapes approached us. They were at least seven feet tall and clad in some kind of gray fabric jumpsuits that covered all but their heads. Their heads were elongated and their faces were oval and very pale. They had no hair. Their eyes glowed just like phosphorus, make it, making it almost impossible to look at them. Their ears were close to their heads and pointed. They appeared to have normal noses. The creatures had a slit where their mouth would be. They walked towards us and picked us up, each carrying one of us in his arms. We were completely limp, with no control over our muscles or movements. Yet my mind was functioning and alert, and I felt aware of everything. A feeling of terror swept over me, and as though the being sensed it or even knew it from inside my brain, I could feel the being talk to me to calm me down. Yet there were no words spoken. It was as though this creature could communicate without saying anything. So Grazia is describing telepathy here. It's apparent she's not familiar with it. But as she says, the being didn't seem menacing after that, and I was filled with wonder and awe at what was happening. They carried us inside into what seemed to be a large laboratory, pure white and full of strange instruments and gadgets. Batteries of little colored lights glowed and blinked in the panels around the wall. We were placed on reclining chairs, like those dentists use, but more advanced in design with buttons and lights built into the sides, and they began to perform some kind of test on us. They swung down various devices from overhead and positioned them above our faces and bodies. I was filled with dread, but then I realized that nothing they were doing hurt at all. I have no idea if they scanned our minds or took any fluids or injected anything. 
There were no marks or bruises. They simply pointed things at us and studied whatever it was their instruments told them about us. This lasted perhaps an hour, maybe longer. I lost all sense of time. They seemed to know exactly what we were feeling and thinking. The two beings never spoke to each other, but I got the idea they were communicating and comparing notes in some way we could not understand. So after being examined, the next thing Grazia recalls is these instruments sliding back into the ceiling, and both she and her husband were carried off the ship and placed into the exact spot and position they had been sitting. Now she has no memory of this craft even taking off. Following this, they were physically fine, though they did have some anxiety and nightmares. And researcher Antonio Chiomiento learned that there were four other sightings that night in that area. He also went to the site and saw the samples of, or saw the crushed and burned grass and took samples of it. And he was absolutely convinced of the veracity of this case. And as he says, in my 10 years of UFO research, I have never been involved in so explicit a case of alien contact as that of the Richies. The Richies told me they used to ridicule UFO reports. They never believed a word of them. Their encounter has left them badly shaken and no longer in doubt. The incident has convinced them that super-intelligent life forms are out there and that they know who we humans are. I am totally convinced that the Richies are telling the truth. I haven't the slightest doubt they really did experience a close encounter of the third kind. I think you'll agree those are definitely astonishing cases. And there's so many of them. The 10 I present here are, as you know, just the tip of the iceberg. Many people believe, many investigators believe that there are probably millions of cases, not hundreds of thousands, millions. So it's vastly underreported. We know this. Most people do not report their encounters, especially if it involves an onboard encounter or face-to-face -face encounter with ETs. Sightings, yes, but more than that, it's rarely reported. And again, as you can see, coming from all over the world, stretching back many decades, still going on currently, this is a very important subject. That's why I want to do these videos, because I think if everyone knew these things happen, it would change our behavior. It would change the way we look at our, each other, at our place in this universe. And I like these cases because they show some really remarkable patterns. As you can see, the most common thing people report when being taken on board a UFO is being physically examined. Grays are quite common, though certainly not the only type of ET, but they're all humanoids, arms and legs, that sort of thing. I find that quite interesting. Also interesting is how many, many people report being taken while they're driving. And quite a few of these cases, they're not only taken um, while driving, but their car itself is lifted up into the craft. This shows how truly astonishingly advanced the technology of the ETs are. And I really love the cases involving long conversations where the people are given information about why the ETs are here. So yeah, very interesting. As you can see, there's a lot of fear with some of these cases. Though in most of these cases, as I found out in my own research, people feel that this was not necessarily a malevolent experience. Although scary, um, some people actually thought uh, it was a good thing for them, a benevolent experience. So that's an important factor, I think. At any rate, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I truly thank you for watching, and I really appreciate it. Till next time, keep looking for answers, keep searching for the truth, and most important, keep having fun. Bye for now.